Hello and welcome to our third and final session with Alex Bakulia. Alex is a senior lecturer of English and Literacy Education in the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and the Language and Literacy Research Hub. We are online today, um, but a reminder, a recording of this session and previous sessions will be available on ACME Education's YouTube shortly. Uh, on behalf of ACME and Alex, we would like to acknowledge that ACME is on the lands, the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay respects to elders past, present, and extend that respect to all First Nations people of this land and to whom may be present with us in this lesson today. Over to you, Alex. Thanks, Gary, and um, to all those who are viewing this today live or on delay on the, the ACME Education YouTube channel, uh, thanks for joining us. It's understandable that teachers and educators and parents will have an interest in how video games might be leveraged for school learning, how the engagement and the excitement associated with gameplay might be something that we think about as a tool or resource for improving or contributing to school learning. And this inevitably raises a whole bunch of questions about how we do that, how we bring a technology that's typically um, utilised for entertainment outside of schools into the classrooms for some kind of productive curriculum objectives. And so this, the third in a, a series of, of seminars, focuses on some of those more logistical challenges, some of those nuts and bolts around how we might plan and design a curriculum that has a video game or games at its centre. So as I mentioned, this is the third in um, a series. The first part in this series focused on moving us beyond the idea of engagement. We accepted that engagement is great. It's important that students are engaged, that of course schooling is about other things as well as engagement. And in particular, we're interested in how we might um, create bridges or pathways between what games have to offer and school learning, or more specifically, subject learning, and even more specifically, conceptual subject learning. In our second session, we were interested in thinking a little bit more deeply about the way instructional pedagogy might open up or close off opportunities to read video games in particular ways. So anyone watching gameplay will be able to make some kind of sense of what's happening. If we're bringing games into our classrooms, we have particular goals in mind. And so this forces us to think a little bit more carefully, bit carefully about what kinds of readings or meaning making opportunities um, we're giving students in these classrooms. And in this, our third and final session, we'll look at some of the, the ways we might configure classrooms, some of the considerations around um, creating a, a game-centered curriculum. So, I've, I've got six considerations that I want to explore, and there are others, um, the given time constraints. I think these are the most important. And what I'm trying to get us to do by, by focusing on these six is to, to realise that it's a lot of the, the hard work is done very early on in, in thinking about the factors that will impact or that will shape your game-centred curriculum. And, and realising that some of these are quite complex and the, the positions we take or the, the structures that might limit us will contribute to learning in, in different ways, sometimes in proactive ways, sometimes in constraining ways. So we'll talk about the purpose of the game-centred curriculum, some questions around game selection and what might impact game selection. We'll look at game length as a factor that we should consider. Some of the more technical issues around software and hardware. We'll look at different ways we might configure or set up our classrooms for play. And we'll look at some examples of playful pedagogies, the types of instructional strategies that um, teachers might adopt. So on the question of the purpose, it's, it's fundamental that we start with these two questions. Rather than starting with which are the fun games or which are the games my students are playing? It's really important, given that the, the context of these three sessions has been on school learning, that we ask, what is it we want to achieve? What are our particular classroom objectives? 
And if you saw the first session in this series, you realize I was trying to push you beyond engagement as our, our only objective. It might be one of them, but I was really encouraging in that session for us to think beyond engagement. But what do we want to achieve? And how will the thinking and the discussion around that question then impact what ends up in our curriculum plan? And the second question to, to influence us is how will video games help you achieve this? How are there, there are aspects of this particular digital technology um, that can create new or different opportunities for learning? So in thinking about the game centered curriculum, we might want to achieve engagement. We might have specific literacy goals. These might be more skills-based or operational literacy goals, particular reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills. They might be more cultural literacy goals. And here I'm using the term cultural in terms of subject-specific cultures or subject cultures. So it might be there's something about um, subject history, particular ways of thinking in history that are encapsulated in a particular game. And the game becomes a way for us to enculturate students into those, those literacy practices. Maybe we have more critical goals. Maybe there are, there are aspects of games that are really problematic, game cultures um, that are problematic. And we want to give students opportunities to interrogate games and game cultures. Maybe our purpose is about knowledge. And this might be ludic knowledge in terms of ludology, knowledge about games, how games work. If we're English literature teachers, maybe we're interested in literary knowledge, knowledge about stories and narratives and texts. And there are particular games that are gonna help us explore those, that kind of knowledge. Maybe we're interested in really specific subject knowledge. And there are some games that can help us get to that subject knowledge to realize that knowledge. Our purpose might be influenced by by themes, particular themes that we want students to be able to engage with that have been um, coded into a game. And it's very likely that our purpose is informed by curriculum requirements. And these requirements um, kind of set up what it is we need to achieve in a particular time period, four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. And given our context is school learning, this process of designing a game-centered curriculum is also influenced by questions around assessment. What is it you're going to assess? Will you be assessing gameplay? Will, be, will you be assessing the social activity around gameplay? Will assessment take a more traditional form in terms of an essay or a test? And it's about some kind, therefore you know, that relies on other kinds of literacy practices. Or, Will assessment not be a part of, of your curriculum? Will there be other goals that, that don't require you to, to, to build in summative assessment? In terms of game selection, this is probably the question I get asked the most. You know, what are the games that, that, that you suggest? What are the games that you recommend? And I'm very reluctant to answer those kinds of questions because it depends so much on that previous slide on what your purpose is. You know, if, if your purpose is to make maths more fun, more enjoyable, and that immediately rules out the vast majority of, of games that are designed for entertainment, for pleasure. So considering the themes that you want to explore with students and the appropriateness of themes that are, are in a particular game and the audience becomes really important and will be a factor that guides um, game selection. In the Australian context, classification ratings will also impact game selection. Um, we have particularly strict um, classification rulings in Australia, which means that almost any game that has some kind of simulated violence almost always receives an M rating. That makes it pretty difficult to use that without a lot of permission forms or, or a lot of um, paperwork. So, Often, once we have determined our purpose, and then we move in towards game selection, decision making, we will be guided by the limitations of how games have been classified by, in our case, the Australian Classification Board. And these two questions, these two factors go together the duration of study and the number of games. So, how long do we have in our game centered curriculum? 
Now, is this about introducing a game for, for one double period and that's the last we'll, we'll see of it? In which case that's going to impact what kind of game we introduce. Some games have a, a very high bar in terms of learning the controls and learning the user interface and all the symbols that are on the screen. So if we're only going to have the game in our curriculum for a double lesson, we're going to need to avoid those kind of games because all the time will be spent learning how to play rather than engaging with the content. And the second part of this is, is the how many. Is this about the sustained use and study of one game? Or is this about studying many games briefly? And the image that you see on your screen is taken from a, a senior school which has incorporated, ga incorporated games into its senior literature curriculum. And you can see how they map out their use of different games. And so in the, the green box, you see that's where students for about seven weeks will focus on two games, Unpacking and Firewatch. And they'll be using those two games to explore notions of purpose, context, and an audience. There's then a period of about four or five weeks where there's an introduction to literary criticism. And uh, the game isn't mentioned here, but I can tell you the game there is, is Papers, Please. And then finally, students move towards a, a shorter three-week week study of the game, The Beginner's Guide, which will be used to explore the concept of the death of the author. So in this particular curriculum, you've got four games over the space of about one and a half terms or a semester. And you can see it's about three to four weeks per game. So the amount of time we have to dedicate um, to our game centered curriculum will impact on our game selection. And related to this is the issue of game length. How long does it take or your average player to make it from the start to finish. And of course, there are some presumptions here that making it from the start to the finish is important. Perhaps given your purpose, that's not important. But what I'm trying to visualize for you here is the vast range in time it takes to complete different games. And so we might get really excited by a game that our students are playing in their own time and see connections to our curriculum and get and think, okay, you know, all my students, they're, they're playing straight with their friends and, and, and they're talking about it. So I'm gonna find a way to connect this to my curriculum. Not realizing that it takes a lot of hours of gameplay to get through straight from start to finish. Likewise, a game like The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, which is incredibly popular, a really sophisticated um, video game. But as you can see, or rather it looks like the text has just dropped off there, it's about 60 to 120 hours. And so that really limits your ability to, to for, for the ability for students to be able to complete the game and then also have other classroom activities that explore aspects of that game. The other end of the spectrum is a game like Paperback, much shorter. And I put all of these particular games up here because I've worked with different teachers who have incorporated these games to different degrees. And they've had to make decisions about whether class time would be spent playing the entire game, which was possible with a game like Never Alone over the space of about four weeks, and whether there are other games where it's just about getting into the first 30 or 40 minutes and using particular themes or particular game elements or particular language or story as the impetus to, to study um, or as the focus of study rather than the entirety of the game. So it does require a little bit of shift in thinking, um, especially for those you know, English and literature teachers who are used to selecting a text and studying the whole text. Here, we'll need to keep in mind whether that's still achievable with some of the, the longer games that are available um, to us. In terms of technical considerations, and there are a lot, we can start with devices. Obviously, in order to, to realize a game, to manifest a game, we're going to need to do that through some kind of technological device. And there's a range of possibilities here. There are game consoles, there are personal computers, um, many schools still have computer labs, and, and there are also tablets now, you know, trolley of tablets. And this is a really important consideration, and I've worked with schools that have started with this consideration because they were so limited. Because obviously the devices available 
to your context will then impact on your game selection questions or game selection options and your play options. So for example, if, if you're working in a school which is a BYOD school or bring your own device school, this becomes a real hurdle because your students are likely to have a wide range of devices that might run Windows or um, Apple, have Apple computers. And not all games will necessarily work on all those devices. Um, your school might not necessarily have the, the technical support to come into the classroom and support all students to install that. Alternatively, you might have a computer lab that's set up that runs a particular operating system. You might have um, been an educational system that has some strict rules about the installation of new software that limits your ability to install games. Um, for some schools I've worked with that have had budget, the easiest option was just to purchase some consoles, which is some Xboxes or some Switches. And they became the device through which students engage with the game. Of course, there are going to be costs with um, any innovation like this. One of them is a game license, and these can range enormously. You know, there are some indie games that can cost one or two dollars when they're on sale. And there are some really sophisticated games like Legends of Zelda that can be about a hundred dollars. And if you, you're thinking about installing games on devices and you've got a year level of 300 students, clearly cost becomes a factor. Likewise, if your plans involve upgrading infrastructure, that's going to come with a cost. So keeping in mind the various costs will also impact on your planning. And something that goes that's underappreciated is, is a consideration of sustainability. How sustainable is this particular innovation that I'm introducing? In some school systems, um, a teacher might select a new text and the school will purchase couple of large tubs that sit in the library and the school, the teacher will pick up a tub of the books and bring them to each class and take them back to the library. And the teacher can know that for the most part, those books will always be there. Sure, they'll deteriorate to some degree, um, but they, they exist. And we can't always say the same with digital technologies. They become obsolete over time and unfortunately much quicker than we'd like. So we do need to consider how sustainable our our decisions are. Um, many games these days run through particular platforms, Steam being a common one. So now we're dependent on the sustainability of that platform. Um, and likewise, the infrastructure. There was one school I worked in which had um, the game Never Alone on several trolleys of iPads. And we thought this was a great way to, to, to run this particular program. What we hadn't factored in was that playing the game required a Wi Fi connection. And that two or three classes at once all logged onto the, the trolleys of iPads, um, put enormous pressure on the, the school's Wi Fi system. So these are questions around sustainability and, um, and technology that need to be considered. And lastly, issues of gameplay and progression. Will my game that I've selected require individual accounts for students? Will they need to log into those accounts? Can students save their progress? Now, if we've made a decision around a device like a console, where a classroom will have one or two consoles and a game is installed on that console, and when I have my class, we get up to the first, to, the, to level three. Another class comes in after me, and they then have to start at level three or potentially reset the game and start from the beginning. What then happens when I return to that classroom? So the idea of progression creates another little hurdle for us to consider, which doesn't exist with things like a tub full of textbooks or novels. Of course, if we're going to introduce games, it's likely that we also want to introduce gameplay. And that requires thinking about how we're going to create a particular circumstance play. What kinds of play do we want in our classroom context? I call this the configurations of play. And this is based on research that, um, that Brady Nash and I did looking at the entire field of, of research in this space where teachers brought games into their classroom. What did they say about how they set up those spaces? And what we found was that there were six common configurations. 
The first and simplest is single player gameplay. Each student has their own device and plays the, the identified or selected game on their own device. And so a teacher might look out across their classroom of 25 kids and each student is on their own device playing the game. Single player gameplay. An alternative configuration was turn-taking play, so where you didn't have enough devices. Here, students take turns playing on a single device. So there was one classroom I worked with that had four switches, and there were four or five students sitting around each switch with a single controller. And so those four or five students would kind of rotate through play, they'd take turns. Another option is multiplayer play. In this instance, Again, you have multiple students around the same device. It might be you, or is usually a console, but each of the students around that console will have a controller. And so as a part of my PhD research, um, I used a console and I'd have four controllers around each console. So all the students in that group were always in play. Another configuration that, that we identified was no play. And this configuration, play, um, isn't evident. A teacher has decided to use games in the classroom or, or game literacy, but without the option for play. And so it's about the viewing of somebody else's gameplay. Usually it's YouTube playthroughs. Another kind of play was the player's design. And this was usually in the, the design classroom or the media classroom where the focus is on game making, but inevitably a process in game making is, is testing your, your coding and playing the games that you're making. And the last one, which was probably the, the least common was teacher play. And I'm glad this was the least common. And this configuration usually involved the teacher playing a game on their own device, usually a, a laptop, which was projected onto a screen and students would watch that screen. So clearly decisions around how you configure play in your classroom are also tied to some of the, the technological factors around what kind of technology you have available to you. But you can see how different configurations will open up and close off opportunities for both play, for immersion in the game world, for the ability to take control over an avatar or a character. And I also want us to consider what I term playful pedagogies. And I use this term here to capture the way teacher instruction, the way a teacher sets up opportunities for play, so the way they organise time, creates different opportunities for engaging with game play. The easiest way to think of this is in terms of the at-home or the at-school game play. So you might have a teacher who has a game-centred curriculum and they're really keen for students to play that game in the classroom. And play is a core part of classroom, so this would be um, at-school play. Similarly, you might have a teacher who's required to teach a game-centered curriculum because that's what everyone in that year level is teaching. They don't really believe in play. They're not comfortable with play. They're not comfortable with consoles. So they may mostly set gameplay as something to take place at home. And there are a couple of other binaries here for us to think about. Um, the free play structured play binary is a really interesting one. Do we want to give students opportunities to play the games we've selected freely? without other literacy activities, without any reading or writing activities, without any comprehension? Is there something about free play that's creative in and of itself that we value and create time for? At the other end of that spectrum is the notion of structured play. And this usually occurs when teachers are, are hyper aware of their learning goals. And sometimes teachers interested in structured play are are reluctant to put a lot of faith in game-based learning in and of itself. And so they create a lot of other activities around play. So it might be taking notes while playing. It might be a moment of play and then a pause, complete an activity, then another moment of play. So the game plays in the classroom, but it's one component of an otherwise highly structured lesson. And the final binary to consider is the, the solitary play versus social play. Now, I've seen classrooms that were dead silent. Classrooms where you had a one-to-one, -to -one, so single-player gameplay, and students played games on their own, 
It's a part of their curriculum with headphones in. Everyone was dead quiet. That was the way the teacher had configured that space. And I've seen other classrooms studying the same text, the same game. The incredibly social space, noisy space, students yelling and talking to each other and discussing their gameplay. So you can see with this diagram how decisions we make around when, what opportunities students will have to, to engage with the game, to pick up that controller, you know, impacts a whole range of, of learning opportunities. You know, is this going to be a dialogic space where talk becomes a resource for learning? Or do I want my students working silent for a particular reason? Is there something about a particular game that has a highly creative immersive world and I'm happy for students to explore that world freely, that interruption, that other academic activity? Or do I want to structure students' time? These are things to keep in mind as we're planning individual activities within individual lessons. I mentioned earlier, I'm usually reluctant to, to make suggestions around individual games, um, but what I have got here is just a small number of suggestions. I'm not going to talk through them, but what you'll see, and you can pause um, as you're viewing this um, and pay more attention to each individual game, but what I've just tried to highlight with each of these games are some of the themes that each game explores, but as well as that, some of the, the game elements or, or other areas um, that you might focus on if you were centering this for study. And I think what it reveals is, is the diversity of themes that one could explore through a game centered curriculum, but also the some starts to introduce some questions around ludology, knowledge about games, and game structures or game elements that might be the focus of a game centered curriculum. These are probably more appropriate to your, your early secondary years. These are some suggestions that include some um, slightly more advanced themes or perhaps more middle teenage adolescent themes. And these games are likely to have some higher game ratings or more mature game ratings. And these are some games that are, are more complex. Um, they're often meta in the sense that they reflect on themselves, they reflect on games, or they introduce um, themes about life uh, that might be appropriate for an older audience. Before we finish up, I do want to mention some other resources that are out there. Um, a great place to go is the um, is Acme's game lessons set of resources where you can see examples of, of games curricula and see how other um, teachers and educators have organized um, sequences of three or four or five lessons centered around a single game. Um, the Hey Listen Games website is also another place where you can see some longer units that focus on individual games. And if you're interested in a more academic audience in a a place or a community that's interested in some more academic questions around um, ludology, um, language learning, pedagogy, um, and a site that has um, a range of different articles that are some of that are more practical about how, some of them that are a little bit more theoretical. Um, you might be interested in the ludic language and pedagogy community. So across this three session sequence, we've looked at notions of conceptual learning and started to explore how games might be one digital technology that can contribute to conceptual learning, but that if this is something we're interested in, that learning will be deeply tied to a whole range of other factors like context, like values, like pedagogy. We've looked at questions around reading and how different decisions we make will impact the opportunities for making meaning through gameplay in school classrooms. And we've started to unpack in this session some of the, the planning and design challenges um, that are, are central to, to any effort to centre this particular technology for, um, for school learning. I think we have some time now for questions. Right, um, I think we'll have to leave it there. Um, if you are interested in doing this kind of work, 
I would strongly encourage you to, to reach out to form networks, to, to reach out to teachers in your school or other schools. Um, I'm more than happy to support teachers interested in designing their own game centered curriculum that works for them. There's also now a lot of resources out there and, and ACME is a wonderful place to start as well. Best of luck.